Ramona Koval has been one of our best loved broadcasters when it comes to books. Now she's written her own memoir about the books that have shaped her life. Ramona, welcome to Booktopia. Thank you for having me, Cara. Now, do you think that people like you and I are people with a problem? Do we have an addiction when it comes to reading? We do have an addiction when it comes to reading um, because a book that you are reading and loving is such a wonderful companion and you can go back to it at those small parts of the day that you might have room for it. You can make room for it. Um, it can be your guide, it can be your friend, it can be your teacher, uh, it can show you a whole world that you didn't know existed. It can give you uh, an insight into lives that you haven't lived. I mean, it's the only way. It's a time machine. It can take you back in history. It can get, take you to to fantasy worlds. Um, oh well, what 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 is it? What like, better it's is like there? Unconditional love, isn't it? It's just that I'm thinking. If of you the fact find that the right one, though. yes, yes, there is that. So you need navigators, don't you? And it, and in a sense, you've been one of our most cherished navigators for a long time. And now you're revealing the books that have been so important in your life to you in this in this book by the book. Helen Garner once confessed, though, that she, she was a bit of a book binger, that she kind of wolfs them down, which goes again to this kind of addiction issue. Is that the way you read? Are you a binger? Look, I had to be a binger um, for so many years when I was working um, in, in the literary area, um, especially when I had the book show where it was a five-day-a-week book show and I read everything that I ever talked about. So it was a matter, it was binging, it felt like being uh, on a conveyor belt of books and you, you know, you threw yourself into one book and you, and you ate it all up and then you, you thought about it and you talked to the author and then you, and another one was coming and then another one was coming. But I mean, I had the great uh, fortune, good fortune of only reading books that I wanted to read. So I chose what to read and I thought always, you know, oh, yeah, I need to read this book or I'd like to know about that or I've always wondered about that author or I've loved that author before so I'll read that one. Now it's a little bit different. Um, well, for this book, I just went back to the books that I loved and remembered and the ones that I had around me I read again. The ones that I remember that I didn't have around me I found uh, on, uh, on Gutenberg.org what a wonderful repository of, of out-of-print books um, or I got them online and I read them on a Kindle and I reacquainted myself with m the books that made me. Well I'm very glad to hear you say that you got some of them online that was very good of you I there. did, I did. <laughs> Would you like to talk about a couple of books that have been really significant in a way that you could almost describe them as say life-changing that have been sort of markers along the way for you? I'm thinking of maybe books that have cemented your um, feminist convictions, for example? There was um, The Man Who Loved Children, for example. Um, I loved that book when I you know, read it, and I read it for school, and um, I suddenly thought, this book is so unlike any other book that I have read before. Um, I must have been 14 or something like that. And it was about a family that wasn't happy. Mm. It was about a difficult relationship between a daughter and a father, and it was about sort of a kind of cruelty in a parent, uh, a kind of resistance in a girl. And, um, and I suddenly realised that you could actually have a book about an unhappy family, like the one I had at home that I went home to. So there's that kind of instant recognition that someone has been able to capture something that is about your life. Exactly. But then again, Colette and uh, the, the uh, short stories of Colette, My Mother's House and Cedo, I loved those short stories, partly because um, they were uh, a beautiful account of um, a feisty woman in the mother, Colette's mother, Cedo, mm -hmm. um, a fascinating insight into a marriage that was a love match of uh, Cedo and the captain, the older um, returned soldier with one leg that she was married to. Um, uh, partly because then I went on to read other Colette books and, and her, of her sort of life in the demi-monde of, uh, of, of Paris in the, in the early part of the century and all the possibilities for different kinds of relationships with men, with women, with younger men, um, uh, all, all kinds of uh, roles she, she played. 
just hearing you talk about her, Ramona, it sounds to me as if she's someone you would love to have interviewed, you would love to have met her. So for you, is that sort of a, a natural reaction? When you love the book, do you think to yourself, I, I would really like to meet that author? Sometimes I do, but I do know that you know it, it sometimes is a mixed blessing meeting an author. And sometimes um, meeting an author that you love um, is it does actually spoil the books or spoil anything else they might write afterwards. Yeah, it's a if, risk. It is a risk if it isn't a thoroughly wonderful experience. You are a great armchair traveller and one of the things that Buy the Book does so well is tell us about the books which have led you on journeys without you ever having to pack a bag or leave home. That's true and of course what a, what a safe way to travel. But the whole thing is that you have to trust the person who's taking you there. And I don't know um, about you, Cara, but there have been people who I've thought to myself when I've interviewed them, do I want this person to have been my emissary in the world? And if this person was the one who's gone off to these places and told me that, oh, these people are rather odd and these people are rather rude and this, you know, complete disaster happened, and then I meet them and I suddenly thought, maybe it was you. <laughs> Maybe if I had been on this trip, it wouldn't have been like okay, that. Okay, so who are the navigators that you trust to take you then on journeys into the unknown? Give well, us the names of a couple. There's a few, like in Australia, Nicholas Rothwell is someone whose um, knowledge, sensitivity, sensibility, um, understanding I trust, especially uh, in, the, in the north of Australia, in remote Australia, in Aboriginal Australia. Um, when he was a foreign correspondent um, for the Australian, um, we had a conversation. He said to me, "Oh, they want me to go to the Middle East, and this is this was you know, a, you know when Iraq was was very hot." Yeah. And uh, he said, "What do you think?" And I said, "Well, look, I know you know if, as a friend, I don't want you to send you to the Middle East, but I'd really like you to go because you're somebody I trust, and I would really like to know what you think about what's going on there." One of the things that I really liked about um, by the book was the sense that you are still sort of a work in progress when it comes to reading and you have these tasks. You talk about the books that are on your self-improvement program. What are the books on your self-improvement program? Well, Proust is on my self-improvement program. I haven't read um, Does life research. feel meaningless to you or do you feel like a failure because no, you have No, I haven't? don't. I never feel like a failure. I mean, when, I, when people say to me, oh, have you read X? I say, well, no, but I've read Y, Z, A, B, C, J. I mean, I, I, when I looked at the, the index on this book, I thought, what an eclectic group of books. What a strange woman this woman must be. But why do you even have the notion of books that are for self-improvement? Do you really think that there are some books that are worthy and that are sort of required? Do you look, subscribe to a kind of canon I that do. you should read? I do, because, look, I'm always looking for the rules of life. Um, partly because of the kind of family I was from and uh, the fact that they didn't speak English very well. Although my mother was a great reader, she wasn't a great communicator about the books and why they should be read. Um, uh, and because I didn't have a literary education, I had a scientific education. Mm. So I always felt, not exactly a, f I wasn't fraudulent, I just, I always felt like I was just learning in this area. And all the books I was reading were, were coming to me because I thought, well, this is a whole area that I don't know anything about and I really must. So I was confident in, in the scientific area, but I didn't know much about poetry, I didn't know much about history, I didn't know much about literature. So in the last 25 years or so, that's been my task to get on top of some of these things. And I mean, of course, I, I knew that there were classics that I should read because why would otherwise why would they be classics if people shouldn't read them? <laughs> so what are the books that have defeated you or the genres? Because I'm I'm perfectly willing to admit that I just cannot do fantasy and sci-fi. They just I can't. I can't enter into those worlds. So what have you tried and come up against and failed? Look, I tried to read things like um, uh, the Tale of Genji Yes. Um, I tried to read uh, the Icelandic sagas. For me, it's sort of like swords and 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 people bonking each other on the head. And with the Icelandic sagas, I just got confused with all the names too. There's Engelbert and Engelhump and Edbert and Four Ed somethings, and I just get confused with it all. I just have no patience. That's the problem. 
I have no patience. So I feel that even if I didn't know you as I do, I'd feel like you and I are sitting in a coffee shop and we're having a chat and you're telling me about books that have inspired you, books that you've taken on amazing trips, like when you go dog sledding <laughs> and you're knocked off the dog sled into a snowdrift. That really made me laugh. But now, you, 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 seem, you seem to find dog sledding ridiculous. It's, it's I, I find it difficult to imagine you all rugged up in all those layers of thermals that you describe and going sort of whooshing along and then tipping over. That is a comic moment. It is a comic moment. It was a comic moment. But, you know, um, I had been reading all of those um, explorer journals. For some reason, I had been collecting exploration journals for po in polar regions. It was almost like uh, a book came into the office. It's about Fridtjof Nansen and his uh, uh, crossing the Greenland. And I thought, oh, right, that's for me. And I'd read it and I'd interview uh, Roland Hunt, who wrote, wrote the book. And then something would come in. And then uh, I think I think Text um, published uh, South, which is the Shackleton voyage. And I was, oh, that'll be for me. So I'll read that. And, and then I had to think in this book, why have I got all these books? I wondered about that. Do you have an answer to that? Because I think you must have been an Arctic explorer in a previous life. <laughs> I think it's because I'm completely um, intrigued about survival. I'm completely intrigued and a bit nervous about the possibility that everything will end and I will have to use all the knowledge in my head to make soap, make candles, um, food, food, food. <laughs> uh, clothing, um, all that stuff. And that's why I think I, I've got this book called Home Management, um, where which was left in a, an old um, uh, boarding house room that my parents used to run once when somebody did a flit, and all they left was home management. And in the home management, you've got everything. I mean, it must have been published in the early 50s. Everything that you need for, for just living. Like, you can make candles, you can knit, you can cook... You can um, raise ducks. I think it's a bit of anxiety about about survival. And um, so those guys, they went out. They went out with the most flimsy of clothing, the most ridiculous things. And they went out and they just kept walking and walking and walking. Some of them didn't make it. But I just love the spirit of them. And if you read Scott's journals, um, you know, he's sort of a bit of a stiff upper lip character, of the sort of Englishman he was at the time. But he's got a section there where he describes the sound of the snow and being inside his, his um, warm um, uh, sleeping bag and the dogs and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the, the wind. And you're just with him there. Mm. And I just, I think it's so sweet and so sad and, and so romantic. I'm a great romantic, it turns out.